Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad that you've decided to join us. We're taking a look at the Sabbath School lesson in advance of the time when our regular friends do. This is the lesson for February 25. It's lesson number eight in our series on glimpses of our God. It's entitled Creation Care. We would like to begin with a word of prayer. Would you bow your head with us? Our wonderful Father, we come once again to celebrate you and all that you have done for us. Today we would like to discuss what all that involves and some aspects of it that might be a little controversial. Guide us that we may walk in the correct paths and we may suggest the right ideas is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this lesson is about the home that God made for us to live in. You know about Genesis 1, 26 to 28, and we are told there that human beings were supposed to have dominion over all other creatures and to care for them, even in the perfect environment of the Garden of Eden. What do you suppose that implies? Have dominion. Does that mean we can use them for whatever purpose we want? Possibly, Probably. as long as it's a sanctified purpose. That's a pretty <laughs> limiting <laughs> expectation. <laughs> Dennis, what were you going to say? I'm going to say uh, it's an, uh, an asset that needs to be appropriately husbanded. Okay. Well, should Adventists become environmental activists? That's really the question of this lesson. If we believe that God created this earth, let's follow the logic here, if we believe that God created this earth and this world, now in the original Greek at least, and this is true also in Hebrew, the word for earth refers to the, the, the rock ball, whatever you choose to call it here, whereas the world in, it involves the, the, the living cosmos, if you will, the work is cosmos in Greek, that, that inhabits the surface of this, this globe and all the creatures that live here. Shouldn't we be more concerned about what happens to those creatures than, than the concern expressed by people who believe that they came into existence by pure random chance? Theoretically, evolutionists believe that new species are being created all the time. Isn't destruction of older species and the production of newer species an essential part of the evolutionary process? No, they actually, they're actually more sensitive to the earth then who is the the evolutionists don't they believe that that if a more powerful species comes along and wipes out an older species that's part of the no, evolutionary this is, process this is a very delicate balance that you gotta gotta maintain here so none of the old species are supposed to be lost well um none of the old species are supposed to be lost what do you mean well, I mean, we have plenty of evidence that species have been, I mean, and if you talk to evolutionists, they will show you these trees full of creatures that no longer exist. Isn't well, that true? I'm just going back to your original question. Yeah. Are you trying to, to say that, um, what are you trying to say? What, what is the question? Well, I'm, I'm saying here that God, we're contrasting two different approaches to this issue. Okay. Creationists would say, God made all the creatures in the beginning. Now, we believe that there have been some variations and maybe there were, you know, two kinds of dogs back in the original and now there are a hundred kinds of dogs, but they're all still dogs, okay? Yeah. That sort of thing. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not limiting that. By contrast, evolutionists want us to believe that we came up from a single-celled animal which got more and more complex and that the process of survival of the fittest has, has down through the years been a case of, okay, if a new, more powerful species comes along and it wipes out the old species, that's a part of the process. Well, today, we took our grandson to the San Diego Zoo. Okay. I did not see any exhibits. There were no cages with some new animal that uh, hadn't been there last year. Now, there were lists talking about uh, uh, animals that are on an endangered species list. There were mm -hmm. 
those that are, are now extinct. So we, what I'm saying, suggesting is that we keep track of the ones that we don't have anymore, mm -hmm. but we have no documentation of new species. Theoretically, coming from a single cell, single organism, the philosophy says that there should be more diversity, we should be having more and more different kinds all the time. Mm -hmm. When in reality, you look at the fossil records and it's just exactly the opposite. There are far more fossils that are extinct than there are ones that are alive. We're going backwards. Well, I don't know if we could say that completely. There are literally millions of different kinds of insects, for example. Have we lost millions? Maybe so. I, I don't know. Okay, I'm going to throw something in here that's not in your regular study because I, I think it's something we need to think about. It, it's, it's implied, but I'm going to spell it out. Seventh-day Adventists believe that Jesus is coming soon. Isn't that part of our name? Adventist. Doesn't that mean Jesus is coming soon? It is even part of our name, as mentioned. In fact, the coming of Jesus has been delayed by us and our ancestors. And my quotation for, in support of that is found in Evangelism, page 695. It was written in 1883. How long ago is that? That's almost 130 years ago, 128 years ago. Had Adventists, after the great disappointment in 1844, held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit proclaiming it to the world, they would have seen the salvation of God, the Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts, the work would have been completed, and Christ would have come ere this. What does it mean when he says ere this? Before this. Before this. And she's writing it when? 1883. 1883. Jesus would have come before this to receive his people to their reward. But in the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, many of the Advent believers yielded their faith. Thus the work was hindered and the world was left in darkness. Left in darkness by whom? Adventists. Had the whole Adventist body united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history. That, Does this, yes? So what did they not do in that, in that, in that Wait, paragraph? Well, first, first, is she affixing blame to somebody? Or is this just a providential happening? Well, so she's saying when the great disappointment happened, hundreds of thousands of people who claim to be Adventists, instead of saying, okay, let's sit down, let's study our Bibles, let's learn what happened, let's, let's move forward, let's, let's prepare for the second coming, even though it seems like it's been delayed. Instead of doing that, most of them ran away. So you're interpreting that, that this is their fault. This, this was is their, their fault. fault. Okay, it wasn't They it didn't wasn't do God's something. They didn't, well, it says there, receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming it to the world. Yeah. They didn't do it. Okay, they didn't do it, but why didn't they do it? Is it, is it? Because they did, got involved it, with the things of this life. Is it there, is, you're interpreting it as that this is a fault of theirs, that they, they did that. It wasn't well, because God held it back. No. It was because right. they did not yeah. choose correctly or right. wisely. So I'm going to ask a very provocative question. Does this quotation mean that Seventh-day Adventists are responsible for all the environmental destruction, all the wars, and all the evil that has occurred since 1883, since we could have been in the kingdom? Well, the only thing is that, um, doesn't Paul say that when Jesus comes that all the mel elements will melt? Yes. Have well, they have, has that happened we, yet? Shouldn't we um, ask God if he comes to be a little more green? Well, we're, we're going to get to that. <laughs> I, would, I would like, that's a separate issue. Let, let's <laughs> no, it isn't. It's, it's what you're getting at. Well, but yeah. I, but, I don't but understand. We're, yeah, okay. We're going we're to come to that in a moment. I, okay. I promise that we'll get to that. My question right now is, is it possible... possible? Are we responsible? Are we responsible? And now I'm going to ask a second question that matches that. 
is it possible that the quickest way to deal with the environmental problems of our world is to finish the gospel so Jesus can return soon, very soon? Well, well, yeah, it's bigger well issues than the you, you, you're using the term Adventist loosely, I think. In the, Am I allowed to do that? Well, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm saying let's, let's define it. Okay. Uh, the Adventists you're talking about in this first statement refer to the group of Christians who were looking for the soon return of Jesus in 1844, which is before the Adventist church was even thought about. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm not talking about the Seventh-day Adventist church organization. I'm talking about Adventists, and, and that's what she was talking about. Well, let's make it more difficult. Okay. She wrote about the General Conference in 1888 mm -hmm. and said that if the church had taken a more appropriate view, mm -hmm. we would be in the kingdom now. Yes. So I think that we can use your same argument and say that the Advent Church is not only responsible for the green issues, but look at all the wars and all of the, the, I've, the, the I've things that, 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 that go on with with time. And she said that, I mean, if you go back to evangelism, page 694 to 697, there are several statements like that that happened at different times. Are we being self, would we be self-centered to admit that or we're kind of thankful that he didn't come back then? Because otherwise we wouldn't have the opportunity to be there. Well, but the, the, the other side of that coin, and I agree with that, but the other side of that coin is the fact that he's not here yet is proof that what? We haven't done our job, right? Yes. Okay, well, let, let, let's, let's switch gears a little bit. We haven't got to Gary's question yet, but I promise we'll come to it. Does that job have to be done before Christ comes? Matthew 24, 14 says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for, and then the end, for a witness unto all nations, and then the end will come. So there's the target. There's the target. Well, now let's come back to be talking. We, we've been talking pretty big, provocative, grand scale type of questions. Now let's come to some very specific ones. One of the major causes of environmental destruction in our world today is the consumption of meat and animal products. It is estimated that 17 billion livestock live in our world. That is about two and a half times the number of people. According to the Water Education Foundation, it takes 2,464 gallons of water to produce one pound of beef in California. Only 25 gallons of water are needed to produce one pound of wheat. 40% of the fresh water used in the United States in the year 2000 went to irrigate crops for livestock. 40%, and we're talking about a water crisis, right? Only 13% was used for domestic purposes for human use. According to David Pimentel from Cornell University, 40 calories of fossil fuel are needed to produce one calorie of protein from feedlot beef, while only two calories of fossil fuel are needed to produce one calorie of protein in the form of tofu. So what you're saying is that uh a meat diet is a very inefficient use of water and land and land. An animal and product diet. Fuels. An animal mm -hmm. product diet. Just the meat is. You got the dairy products and all that goes mm -hmm. with it. Well, when I was in grade school, uh, I remember reading that you could support. Um, let's see if I get this cor correct. That it took seven times as much land to grow the food for human consumption mm -hmm. using meat, cattle, mm -hmm. dairy, uh, as it did for a vegetarian diet. This sounds like it's even worse than that. And, and uh, some are saying, I've seen 10 times. Now this is talking about land areas, not talking uh, just about energy. But there's well, also a poll which was taken in England recognizing this, how many people would be willing to give up their meat diet. Yeah. And uh, it was not very successful there. 
Well, billions of tons of topsoil are being lost in the process of producing feed for livestock. It is estimated that half of the topsoil from the state of Iowa has been lost in the last 100 years. Does that mean Iowa is going to be a wasteland within the next 100 years? Well, according to the Rainforest Action Network, now many of you know that there's huge quantities of rainforest being cut down, particularly in the Amazon Basin. There's more and more evidence to suggest that this rainforest depletion in Amazon is causing the droughts that happen in Africa and probably has something to do with a lot of other global changes that are taking place. But according to the Rainforest Action Network, one football field of rainforest is being destroyed every second of every day. Most of this is to produce and raise livestock. 55 square feet of tropical rainforest are destroyed to make every fast food hamburger which is made from rainforest cattle. The waste products from livestock are one of the largest single causes of greenhouse gases now, and, and, and environmental pollution. Now, some of you have probably heard on the news ripplings and rumblings that we're, we're really trying to clamp down an inter industry from producing all these, these greenhouse gases. By far, the biggest producer of greenhouse gases is cows. Yep. Maybe we should eliminate them. Well, what about well how about some kind of exhaust control? <laughs> what about going back to Genesis 1, 29 and 30? Catch it and burn it. <laughs> yeah. That said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree and seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. Mm -hmm. To every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth. Everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw that everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and morning a sixth day. Yeah. And then, we, then you put your... Uh, N uh, statistics in there. Yeah. Well, when I was in Africa, when energy source was energy sources were a problem, there were places in the rural areas where there were major projects developing what they big drum, big big floating domes. I guess you'd call them. Sometimes steel, sometimes other things. And they had special ways of putting cow manure down into these things. A fresh cow manure down in there, and it would bubble and do all the stuff it does is and produce gases. And then they would pipe this gas into people's homes, and that was the what they used for for cooking their food. Mm -hmm. It was quite an efficient system, actually. But what are we doing of that nature here in the U.S.? It's too much trouble. So all that just goes into the environment. Well, there's a there's quite a movement though to to utilize the materials from feedlots, et cetera, et cetera, and produce uh, methane and Produces other kinds. Uh, make a small, small return on our, there's literally billions of tons yeah. of, of manure that, that's produced every, every year, and, and how do you process that? Like east in well, the Carolina, where they raise a lot of hogs. Yeah. I mean, it just, it's just terrible, the pollution the problems they have with the waste from the hogs. Well, the right. Driving up and down Interstate 5 through the Central Valley of yeah. California in the last two weeks, yeah. you smell it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, wasn't it God's command for men, for humans to go out and subdue the earth? That's well, the we're coming back to that. We're but... Back. but um, I haven't seen anywhere in the Bible where the God says, hold it, hold it, hold it. You've done enough. Okay, hold it right there. It yeah. seems like it's still there. What would we do if God told us that? What would they do? Well, what would we do? Ignore it. That's, that's kind that's of a moot exactly point I, if you ask me no, because no, that's he didn't what the say question, it. That's what we're questioning about. We're talking about right now. It looks well, like I'm, it's I'm about I'm wondering to, about the whole premise, though. Yeah? If, I mean... There's a question there about the whole premise, if you look at it that way. Yeah. Well, a couple more points. Meth well, I'm sorry. In the Gulf of Mexico, there's a 7,000 square mile dead zone where there is no aquatic life, reportedly due to pollution from animal waste and chemical fertilizers. Mm -hmm. 
Ammonia and methane produced by livestock are one of the major causes of greenhouse gases. Methane is a 21 times more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And there's a, a, a website there that'll give you a lot of that information. So, having said all that, how should Seventh-day Adventists relate to all this? Well, the church has produced a statement about environmentalism for Adventism. Adventists. And I, 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 I brought along my quarterly here, um, and maybe I would just take a moment to, to, to read that. Um, February 20. Month. Yeah. Seventh-day Adventists believe that humankind was created in the image of God, thus representing God as his stewards, to rule the natural environment in a faithful and fruitful way. Unfortunately, Corruption and exploitation have been brought into the management of the human domain of responsibility. Increasingly, men and women have been involved in a megalomaniacal destruction of the Earth's resources, resulting in widespread suffering, environmental disarray, and the threat of climate change. While scientific research needs to continue, it is clear from the accumulated evidence that the increasing emission of destructive gases the depletion of the protective mantle of ozone, the massive destruction of the American forests, and the so-called greenhouse effect are all threatening the Earth's ecosystem. These problems are largely due to human selfishness and the egocentric pursuit of getting more and more through ever-increasing production, unlimited consumption, and depletion of non-renewable resources. The ecological crisis is rooted in humankind's greed, and refuses to practice good and faithful stewardship within the divine boundaries of creation. Seventh-day Adventists advocate a simple, wholesome lifestyle where people do not step on the treadmill of unbridled consumerism, goods getting, and the production of waste. We call for respect of creation, restraint in the use of the world's resources, reevaluation of one's needs, and reaffirmation of the dignity of created life. That was voted by the Adventist Administrative Committee, the General Conference, in a session June 29 to July 8 of 1995. So, one of the prime causes of our environmental destruction is the incessant drive to make more money. How should Seventh-day Adventists relate to that issue? Are we just another part of unbridled consumerism, goods getting, and the production of waste? Now, I'll let you think about that one. We believe that God made this earth. Now, let's come back to the scriptural issues. He created man and told us to multiply and care for this earth and all of its creatures. Hebrews 1.3, let's just look at that for a moment. Hebrews 1.3 says he reflects, this is talking about Jesus, he reflects the brightness of God's glory and is the exact likeness of God's own being sustaining the universe with his powerful word. After achieving forgiveness for human sins, he sat down in heaven at the right-hand side of God, the supreme power. So, if Jesus is sustaining the universe by his power, are we directly fighting against him when we damage or destroy our environment? To what extent are we personally responsible for global warming, environmental destruction, etc.? Or are those things just well, big issues that we have no control over, so we just say... We all give off carbon dioxide. That's all a greenhouse gas. And well, so God's doing it, too, if you the, ask me. The plants need the, our carbon dioxide. I know, I know, I know. I just don't understand. It's a much bigger problem than carbon dioxide. And then they but found there. out that this rainforest stuff that bring down the rainforest, that the, the actual... The rotting inside the rainforest is kind of uh, producing greenhouse gases also. So it's kind of equalizing a little bit there. A little bit. So, not, not, not no, a lot. Oh, actually, a lot. A lot. Way more than people thought. There's, there's a lot of this stuff that people are saying that, that are happening that I don't know if it's really happening or not. And I'm not sure if God is such a bad designer that he wouldn't know what, would, what, was, what was going to happen on the earth, mm -hmm. that he would make something that's fragile, so fragile that it couldn't, it couldn't accomplish his purpose. But we have a globe here. 
there's other than the heat of the sun, the energy from the sun, there's basically nothing be at, being added or taken away. We don't add new chemicals. We ever, I mean, maybe a little bit's coming in by way of, way of, you know, meteors or something else like that. But basically, we have we have what we have. Mm -hmm. Okay. If we are consuming it faster and faster and faster, eventually we're going to get to the place where we can't keep up. In fact, that was that was considered to be a serious threat back in the '60s before they started making these more efficient forms of rice and wheat and so forth. There was a real serious threat that China and India, for example, were going to starve to death. So if we're consuming all this stuff, where is it going? It stays on the earth. Well, but it's, it's being turned from a productive form to a, to a, a bad form. Caleb? Does dominion mean consolidation? You know, when you look at how all of these different things, speaking about the cattle uh, farms as you go up I-5, you have very high concentrations of items. Mm -hmm. When you spread that back out, you know, mentioning that we produce carbon dioxide, the plants then take that and generate oxygen. Mm -hmm. And when that's more equalized, you don't have this kind of imbalance. But when you consolidate items, you get these big imbalances where you don't have an equal force to absorb what's being created. Now, I heard something recently, a statement that I haven't had a chance to verify, but it raises some real questions in my mind, claiming that 90% of the carbon dioxide produced by us and by animals, etc., is actually converted back to oxygen by the plankton in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there may be some truth to that. Oh, there is. So, you wonder, I mean, what happened in the days when there was only Adam and Eve producing carbon dioxide? Was there a whole lot less plankton? Well, they didn't have the oceans. Yeah, well, that's true. Well, but after Noah, they did. When Noah, his family came out of the ark, there was, there was a whole lot of ocean and there was eight people. You've got to remember that there's a lot more other things that create carbon dioxide than just people. Animals, yeah. Animals. Any kind of rotting, yeah. any kind of thing like that, yeah. fire, there's, there's um, vents coming out of uh, the ground. There's Not too much of any of that, I don't think, was taking place immediately after the flood. Well, I don't know if you can prove that, but um, you can believe that if you want. <laughs> well, I go back to the question about dominion. Okay. That man was to have dominion over the animals. Mm -hmm. But as we listen to those around us today, it seems like animals and earth have dominion, or they aspire, uh, people, leaders want to make the earth the controller of humans. They want to reverse that. Mm -hmm. It's a pantheism uh, uh, deity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they use this in many different ways, but primarily to raise money, mm -hmm. to raise money for them. They're going to fix the world's problems. You just, you just, you you just pay you us a penalty for, for violating uh, whatever rules. But there's absolutely nothing done with that money to reverse the problem. You're talking about carbon credits and that kind of thing? All sorts of things, yeah. Yeah, all yeah. kinds of things to yeah. uh, uh, also, the sins. Well, your gas license, uh, if you're, your car is in California, you have to have them tested every couple of years. Okay, what, what's the money for that testing go to? Mm, yeah. Uh, no fund. Yeah, it's, it's not going into reversing CO2 and whatever. It's, well, it's they're requiring the manufacturers to become more and more efficient with their engines and so forth. But so that doesn't take a, a, that requirement doesn't take a, an inspection fee every two years. No. So there, there might be some conflict of interest with all this stuff too. Um, no, no. Some conflict of interest. <laughs> but see, to interrupt Gary, my perspective is, is much shorter than that. I think the Lord will come. Mm -hmm before or during this calamity that everybody is uh, proposing. Well, and if you were spreading the gospel fast enough, or if all of us were, forgive me for pointing at you, wouldn't that take care of the problem? 
I think so. Well, so Jesus. Maybe, so maybe we shouldn't be environmentalists at all. I think. Well, if we're not going to be environmentalists, we better be evangelists. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so I think we saying... have to be environmentalists personally. I don't think it's our job as a church to get involved and and de and be detracted from our evangelistic mission that was given to us and be diverted into environmentalism. But I think we as individuals should be very responsive to, to being frugal with, with, nature's, with nature's bounties. Yeah, uh, a biblical example of that. Paul went out and he dealt with a world in which 60% of the population were slaves. Mm -hmm. Now, he could have said, slavery is wrong, I'm going to spend my life attacking it. We would end up with none of, half of our New Testament wouldn't be there, probably. Right, yeah. Paul said, and if you can read Philemon, he had a very clever way of talking about how we should deal with slaves, which would have eventually gotten rid of slavery, but he didn't just directly attack it based on, he said, my job is to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. Maybe that would be a good pattern for us. But, but our church was given the three angels messages yeah. and until we solve that problem that you got right there in the first paragraph or so, we're still going to sit and puddle around down here. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus himself told us that our first responsibility is to love God and our second responsibility is to love other human beings. You know the famous passage, Matthew 22, 37 to 40 and other parallel passages. Can we claim to be doing that if we are destroying the environment that God created and in which, and in which we live? In Genesis 2.15, and let me just read that quickly. Then the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and guard it. Cultivate it and guard it. The King James says to keep it. What does that mean? This, the, word, the Hebrew word there is SMR, we can put it into English letters. It's translated to keep it, suggests to watch over it, to preserve it, and to protect it. Now, Proverbs 27, 20 gives us maybe the other side of the coin here. Human desires are like the world of the dead. There's always room for more. <laughs> I mean, how many people have you heard complaining that they have too much money? I hear a great deal of silence yeah. here. Will there ever be a time when human greed comes under control? People always want more. No matter how much they have, it seems like they want more. And where does that more come from? Ultimately, it has to come from the earth. One way in which we could reduce our impact upon the earth is to correctly observe the seven-day Sabbath. If we stop doing business on that day and everyone rested, as suggested by Scripture, a significant reduction in the use of earth's resources would result. What would happen if we as a human family were to follow the advice on Leviticus 25? You remember the, the advice on Leviticus 25? Let's look at that just very quickly. Lord spoke to Moses, and, and I, we don't have time to read the whole chapter here. He said there's supposed to be a year of restoration that comes every 50 years. But then le even less than that, every seventh year, there's supposed to be a returning of property to the original family owners, etc. There's supposed to be a restoration to, to people who maybe have fell in hard times, etc. They're supposed to be done. And then if in case there's poor people around us, we're supposed to loan to them without charging interest. And then finally, if there are some who even have to sell themselves into slavery, those people are supposed to be released from that slavery after a certain period of time. Now what would happen if we followed something equivalent to that in our day? A rebalancing of the financial world, if you might, you might say. I'm sure it would be a real... But we'd all be agrarian, mm -hmm. and people wouldn't be loaning money for, to make money, because that was outlawed. Banking system would be in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. It well, already is. <laughs> it already is, is right. <laughs> for a different reason. <laughs> yeah. Let's go back and read Genesis 1, 26 to 28 now. Then God said, and now we will make human beings, they will be like us and resemble us, they will have power over, that's dominion over, the fish, the birds, and all the animals, domestic and wild, large and small. 
So God created human beings, making them to be like himself. How much like himself? Well, he created them male and female, blessed them and said, have many children so that your descendants will live all over the earth and bring it under their control. I am putting you in charge of the fish, the birds, and the wild animals. He says it again. So, what does it mean to have power, dominion over the fish, the birds, and all the animals, domestic and wild? Does this mean that we have the right to destroy as many as we want? We just, whatever we want, we take. Or could we actually potentially throw the balance of nature so far off that we would cause some kind of destructive force to be unleashed on this world? Can I speculate? Yeah. I would speculate that sin causes enough problems to where it will be ultimately demonstrated mm -hmm. that sin left to itself will destroy man from off the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. And as he heads over the brink and realizes that there's nothing he can do, there'll be a huge outcry to get back to God to save things. So I, I, a little bit late. A little. It's too late. But I wouldn't be surprised if some horrendous thing like that took place. I look at the uh, visions in Daniel and come to the conclusion that God is in control. And that whatever we do down here does not go unnoticed by him. Mm -hmm. And uh, there may come a time when he will want to step in. But it's, but it's my conviction that... I think he'll have to step in in order to keep man from destroying himself. And that he will step in. That we cannot preserve the planet. We cannot heal the planet of our own power. We're, we're too self-centered. Yeah. However, if, if it says if the children of Israel had done what they were supposed to do and God's plan had been uh, implemented and fulfilled, the earth would have returned to its Edenic beauty, mm -hmm. we're told. So, yes, if we, if we modified our behavior, probably we could with God's blessing. What are the chances of that? Zip and zero and... Before 1883, we could have been in heaven, right. restored to Edenic right. beauty, right, yeah. and absolutely everything else. Yeah. Well, these instructions in Genesis 1 and 2 were given before there was sin on this earth. These were instructions about dealing with the Garden of Eden, right? Now, we usually immediately think about our situation, but Genesis 1 and 2, weren't those instructions about the Garden of Eden? So, what is... Go ahead. I was reading someplace in the last few days about what it'll be like in heaven. And she says that, that we'll go out and do something with the earth. Mm -hmm. Not like we do now. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. That's what she says. Mm -hmm. And you wonder, what on earth would that process be? But that's part of what our labors will be, as I understand it. Well, you might like that, Myra. She, she, I know I'll like it. I'm looking <laughs> she forward likes it to already. that part. <laughs> she likes it the way it is, even here, with the gardening. Well, surely God's plan was not to include wholesale destruction of the beautiful world that she made. Absolutely not. But how has sin, in, the introduction of sin, if you will, changed the implications of this command from God? Here's a, here's a statement from Desire of Ages, page 20 and 21. I, I'd like to read this. Maybe we can comment it as we go, on it as we go along. Now sin has marred God's perfect work, yet that handwriting remains. Even now all created things declare the glory of His excellence. Now if you... I recently had the privilege of visiting New Zealand. It was my first time there. 85% of their indigenous animals are unique. And they have some really interesting creatures down there. Really. In birds that have things that are, their, their quote, feathers are almost like fur instead of feathers and so forth and so forth. There is nothing, Ellen White goes on to say, 
save the selfish heart of man that lives unto itself. No bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves upon the ground, but ministers to some other life. There is no leaf of the forest or a lowly blade of grass, but has its ministry. Every tree and shrub and leaf pours forth that element of life without which neither man nor animal could live. And man and animal, in turn, minister to the life and, of tree and shrub and leaf. Of course, what she's talking about there is the carbon dioxide cycle, as we all know. Mm -hmm. um, the flowers breathe fragrance and unfold their beauty and blessing to the world. The sun sheds its light to gladden a thousand worlds. The ocean, itself the source of all our springs and, and fountains, receives the streams from every land that takes to give. The mists ascending from its bosom fall in showers to water the earth that it may bring forth and bud. That's Desire of Ages 20 mm -hmm. and 21. So everything ministers to everything. Or to at least something else besides itself. Besides itself. Mm -hmm. So when I see my cat jump on a nice pretty little bird and bites well, it and everything, that's the bird ministering to the cat because the cat's hungry? Well, okay. What happens is they, the smaller creatures multiply much more rapidly. I was recently, in fact, it was yesterday, I was at the San Diego Wild Animal Park, not the zoo where Dennis was, and the lady there told us that we need the raptors, we need the birds that fly out and, and catch rats, rats and mice and so forth. She says, if you took one pair of mice at the beginning of the year, you put them in a field where there was an unlimited food supply, and, and man, I've forgotten exactly the, all the details, but basically you, you, you had no limit on their reproduction that there would be, I think it was a thousand feet of, of mice covering this field in, in, within one year. Well, my point is that um, the word ministry is different than the violence that happens in this nature that well, makes it but happen. What, what, uh, what it, I'm saying to you is that the reproduction of mice ministers to the needs of the hawks and the birds that eat mice, including cats. Yeah, I can I can see that, but um, it's it's pretty violent. I mean, <laughs> when you when you're talking about ministry, I was thinking about you know some serpy little loving little thing happening, but but um, she's talking about you know all things yeah. work together in this ecosystem. Well, that and, and that I, again, makes I, everything I, work. Let, let's let's what? codependence. Yeah. Let me, let me talk about an example that I'm very familiar with. I, I spent seven years living in Tanzania. In Tanzania and stretching up into Kenya is the famous Serengeti Park, wild animal area, natural area. There are 400,000 baby wildebeest born every year. If there were no culling of those animals, in about two years, the park would be stripped bare. Mm -hmm. So 400,000 baby, and that's not to talking about the Thompson's gazelles and, the, and the, all the other gazelles and the, and the zebras and the, all those other things that also reproduce at a fairly rapid rate. So all those reproductive plant-eating animals, sure, it, it seems violent, and, and I agree, it, it is violent. You watch a, a lion catch a a zebra, for example, or a gazelle or something, it sounds pretty violent, but otherwise they would die of starvation. Is that any better? I was listening to a lecture not too long ago on this subject, mm -hmm. and it was uh, uh, pointing out that the, the Brazilian rainforest, uh, the life cycle there, the, the decay uh, and everything that goes on on a forest floor, Results in nutrition and enrichment for the for the plants and trees that that grow there. Mm -hmm. That it's a whole cycle, um, and that as as farmers, when we provide the nutrition for the trees or for the plants that we're trying to grow, that we miss the point. Mm -hmm. That we should be providing the nutrition for the microorganisms in the soil, which then provide the nutrition 
in the form that the plants were trying to grow could actually utilize. And what happens in another hundred years when all the topsoil in, in Iowa is gone? It will be replaced. <laughs> Not unless somebody starts doing something different. Well, it, it all got there somehow. Yeah. There's, there's, there's some cy cycles that are happening. Which raises other questions we don't have to time to talk about. <laughs> um, if that much topsoil is gone in 100 years, how, do you, how does it happen that you go to the Grand Canyon, you see all those levels that were supposed to have taken millions of years, and the, 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 the lines are just as crisp and clean as possible, and there's no evidence of erosion at all? Millions of years with no erosion? Hmm. Some kind of a problem in that theory. Well, uh, my crystal ball is, is, is no better than anybody else's, but I don't think we have 100 years to worry about. Mm -hmm. Well, is it possible that some of the events described as the seven last bowls of God's anger, or what we usually call them the seven last plagues, could be a result of environmental destruction? Do you remember the events of Revelation sure. 16? Well, our world is our home. We do not have the option of leaving it and living somewhere else. People are talking about that, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. For this reason, we need to care for it. What environmental issues are important to you? Are there some local issues involving cleaning up the environment or preservation of valuable resources in which you could be involved? Do we as individuals have any responsibility for the larger issues such as global warming and greenhouse gases? The Bible has some interesting comments. Look at Psalm 8, for example. O Lord, our Lord, your greatness is seen in all the world. Your praise reaches up to the heavens. It is sung by children and babies. You are safe and secure from all your enemies. You stop anyone who opposes you. When I look at the sky which you have made, at the moon and the stars which you set in their places, what are human beings that you think of them, mere mortals that you care for them? Yet you made them inferior only to yourself. You crowned them with all glory and honor. You appointed them rulers over everything you made. You placed them over all creation sheep and cattle and the wild animals to the birds and the fish and the creatures of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, your greatness is seen in all the world. And there are other places we don't have time. Let me just maybe read this one, a very familiar one, Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2. The world and all that is in it belong to the Lord. The earth and all who live in it are His. He built it on the deep waters beneath the earth and laid its foundations in the ocean depths. Uh, but anyway, basically there are lots of things suggesting that the, the earth was made by God and it praises, it brings praises back to God. Our famous verse in Revelation 14, verses, especially verses 6 and 7, Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news, this is the gospel, to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. What is that message? He said in a loud voice, Honor God and praise His greatness. For the time has come for him to judge. Worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. Even in our day, when we look down and we suggest that, that this is part of our message to the world, this three angels' messages, that includes the idea that God is creator and we are stewards of what he has created. In what ways do you see nature praising God? When you see the beautiful, beautiful creatures that God has made you visit the zoo or the wild animal park, it's just phenomenal. And the variation, you see some of the birds, just unbelievable. I mean, even iridescent colors. Wow. Or you look at the falls in Yosemite, mm -hmm. the trees, the rocks, yeah. rivers, yep. meadows. I had the privilege of visiting uh, a falls in New, in New Zealand, which is they say is the fifth highest fall in the world, and it sprays out at such a distance it hits a rock and sort of bounces out like this, after you know and then falls hundreds of feet, that you can actually walk around behind it, if you if you want to get really wet. Um, beautiful, beautiful falls. Well, how much does nature teach us about God? I'm sorry, Romans 1.20 says, Ever since God created the world, 
his invisible qualities, what would that include? Both his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen. They are perceived in the things that God has made. So those people have no excuse at all. This is people who ignore all that information. So what does that imply? How do you understand that? Well, I listened to a lecture here given in, in <laughs> Redlands back in May. And it was pointed out that incredibly, uh, the, the, the intricate relationship that, that animals and plants have with each other that uh, seems just astounding. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, animals feed on uh, on the on the brush, but uh, when they feed so far, it becomes unpalatable, mm -hmm. and they go on to other bushes, and the brush then recovers. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's just an oversimplification of that relationship, a very complex relationship uh, between, between uh, animals and plants. Mm -hmm. uh, and interestingly enough, there are places in the world where there are small plants that have trapdoors, and insects go inside, and uh, they're caught inside, and the top clovens down, and the plant digests the insect. I saw one of those uh, pictures of several of them in, from New Zealand. Well, Dr. Sigvi Tonstadt, one of the professors here at Loma University, suggests that we should expand our notions of Sabbath keeping to include creation keeping. Are we sufficiently in tune with nature and our environment so as to at least not thoughtlessly destroy natural resources? The scriptures make it clear that our world will eventually be destroyed by fire. I promise you, Gary, we would get to this. Look at uh, 2 Peter 3, starting with verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise, the heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed, and the earth will, and everything in it will vanish. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon, the day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. But we wait for what God has promised, new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness will be at home. And so, my friends, as you wait for that day, do your best to be pure and faultless in God's sight and be at peace with Him. And, of course, Revelation 21 tells us then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared and the sea vanished. So, should we just say, you know, it's all going to be destroyed anyway. Why should we worry about it? How much do you think is going to be destroyed? Is God going to completely wipe out this earth and start all over again? Well, he'll wipe out enough so that every trace of sin is gone. Mm -hmm. uh, how much that takes, I don't know. <laughs> okay. And I really don't care. <laughs> I see. But how does your understanding of revelation and inspiration affect your relationship to nature? We describe nature as God's second book. Do you see a conflict between God as he's revealed in nature and <coughs> God as he's revealed in scripture? Does our destruction and exploitation of nature have anything to do with that? Ellen White in the book Steps to Christ, page 9, says, Nature and revelation alike testify of God's love. Is that what you see in nature? In what ways can you see the picture of God being the same in nature as it is in Scripture? The Adventist Health Study and its various components since the 1970s has demonstrated, actually starting back into the 1960s, has demonstrated that vegetarianism and the Adventist diet, as described by Alan White, can extend a person's life by as much as 12 years over the general population. If vegetarianism is a huge advantage for the environment and also a huge advantage for us in terms of health, why isn't it more widely adopted? You mentioned the problem of England and the fact that it didn't, there weren't too many people that said they were ready to stop eating meat even though they recognized the problems with it. So why do people choose to eat meat? 
which they, if they really know how destructive it is. Adventists have often spoken up in favor of vegetarianism primarily because of how we read scripture and understand the writings of Ellen White. Should we be speaking more openly about the environmental impact of meat eating? And then, of course, what steps could you as an individual take that would not only improve your own health and life, but also the environment around you? Is it reasonable for us to take such steps? Do you individually feel at least partially responsible for the delay in the coming of Jesus Christ? Are you doing everything that you can do to finish the gospel? Or what more could you do? And the question I asked you back in the beginning, do you think our best response to the environmental problems is to try to hasten the spread of the gospel or to get involved in environmental issues? Now we've talked about both sides of that problem. What's your vote? We were never given a commission to spend the majority of our efforts in the environmental issues. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we can't be uh, sympathetic to them and aware of them and in harmony with our own lives, mm -hmm. but our corporate effort has an entirely different message to to involve our energies. What do the rest of you think? Well, Paul says to worship the creator rather than the creature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Certainly that would be appropriate, wouldn't it? In line of scripture. Well, I think that uh, an understanding of God's agenda would move us to proclaim his righteousness. Mm -hmm. and, and that he has asked us to speak preach the three angels' message. That that's our commission. That's, that's the Laodicean church's commission. Uh, he, he didn't talk about all these other things. Yeah. If we're 128 years behind schedule, maybe more than that, what is there left to do? What should we be doing? We should be getting on the, on the bandwagon, if you call, want to call it that, we should be saying, before, the, before we destroy ourselves through our global damage that we're doing, Lord Jesus, come back. And that, that's the final message of the book of Revelation, is it? isn't it? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Save us from ourselves. Save us from this evil world. Take us home with you to the new Garden of Eden. We'll see you again next week.